All right, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, to our uh, Wednesday evening uh, lecture series. Uh, my name is Dr. Alden Yellowhorn. I'm the director of the Indigenous Research Institute. And tonight we are great, uh, greatly delighted to have our colleague, uh, George, Dr. George Nicholas, who's a professor in the Department of Archaeology at Simon Fraser University. And over the last few years, uh, George has been uh, heading up a large uh, international project called the IPINCH project, or Intellectual Property and Cultural Heritage. And so we're uh, having him as our featured speaker tonight, and he's going to be talking about pragmatism at the intersection of indigeneity, cultural property, and intangible heritage. And before I go any further, let me just uh, welcome you to the homeland of the tsleil Squamish, and uh, Musqueam First Nations. Thank you, and uh, George. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and, of course, to acknowledge that we're on unceded Coast Salish territory. And, in fact, that really sets the stage for where I want to go with this presentation. Uh, this is the entrance to Uluru National Park, and this notion of welcome to Aboriginal land is uh, a precursor to some of the changes that are now under, uh, underway in the realm of heritage. Uh, let me start with a little bit of background by uh, first saying that I'm not a First Nations person, but somehow my mother, when I was six months old, knew that I would have a career and be spending the last 25 or 30 years working with and for Indigenous peoples. Uh, always pay attention to your mother. She, you know, mothers have a sense of where things are going. And over that period of working with Indigenous peoples, there are two basic phases that you know, paint the background for today's presentation. The first is in that uh, about 1991, um, I moved to Kamloops and I began uh, my affiliation with Simon Fraser University and the then recently formed uh, campus on the Kamloops Indian Reserve. And for the next 15 years, I developed and directed an indigenous archaeology program uh, whose mandate was basically to train First Nations people to do archaeology and from my perspective, to do it in the manner that they saw fit, not to do my version of archaeology. And I left that, uh, that program in 2005. And by the way, it closed in 2010. But in 2005, I moved to the main campus, where I've been teaching archaeology ever since. And this is the second phase of uh, the background to what I'm speaking of. And that is, uh, for the last eight plus years, I've been directing the Intellectual Property Issues and Cultural Heritage Project. Uh, and this is a massive, as you can see from a portion of our team, a massive undertaking. And I'll be speaking a little bit about iPinch later in this presentation. Uh, I, I would add that this project officially comes to an end in two weeks after uh, eight years. So this is you know, my last official presentation as the director of the project. So we're dealing with heritage. And, but heritage is one of these things that everyone knows and yet may struggle to define. And I want to give you my working definition of heritage, which is this. And as you see here, heritage is more than things. And in fact, it is much more than things when we, when we see that it represents knowledge and customs and plants and stories and non-human beings and all of those other aspects of people's lives, and in this case, of indigenous people's lives, that it really bears attention to see how that kind of def definition of heritage differs from one in which heritage is all about things that go in museums. But the problem is this, that we're dealing with different cultural systems, Western and non-Western, or indigenous if you prefer, and there are great inequalities between these knowledge systems, particularly when uh, Western uh, political and other systems dominate uh, those of indigenous peoples in so-called settler lands. So I'm going to start with basically giving you the punchline, giving you the four points that underlie everything that I'm going to be talking about this evening. And the first is this, that heritage is not Indigenous heritage is not public domain, and yet that is how it is so often treated. The second is that access to and control over 
one's own heritage should be considered a basic human right. The third is that indigenous peoples historically have received the least benefits from research involving their heritage. And this has been accompanied by a variety of cultural, spiritual, and economic harms. And the last, and this articulates with my work as an archaeologist, the type of community-based research that I've been involved with and many of my other colleagues have been involved with um, really expands, doesn't constrain uh, archaeological research. It's a different kind of engagement with communities, but one that is far more satisfying in the end than most other approaches. So I've divided tonight's presentation into a series of parts, and each is going to be speaking of some of the different aspects of indigeneity and heritage and some of the challenges that we today are facing. And the first is this, uh, questions about who owns, who controls, who benefits from heritage. Is it mine? Is it yours? Is it ours? The question of who owns the past has been uh, discussed in many different contexts for the last 20 plus years in a serious way. And we're all familiar with the kinds of uh, famous objects that sometimes define museums or that serve as a lightning rod for debate, for controversy. And one uh, such example in the British Museum is this the Elgin Marbles, at least that's what they are known as, uh, named after uh, Sir Robert Elgin, who recovered them from the Parthenon under somewhat dubious circumstances, and um, the British uh, Museum has held them ever since on behalf of the British people. But to the Greeks, these are known as the Parthenon Marbles, and the simple change in name is a very strong political statement. And so there is no question, at least to the Greeks, as to who owns the Parthenon marbles as part of their patrimony. And we see aspects of ancient cultures or distant cultures permeating Western society, as you see here in, in the famed Egyptian room in Herod's department store in London. And this is something I'll come back to later. But here you see this is clearly an articulation, uh, a manifestation of, of classic Egyptian um, heritage in a uh, somewhat incongruous um, setting. The question of who controls, who uses, who benefits cultural heritage of indigenous peoples is a very problematic one. And I could show you literally thousands of examples such as these. These are Halloween costumes. And not surprisingly, many indigenous peoples, many Native Americans or First Nations find uh, these types of uses of their heritage, either ridiculous or offensive and all sorts of things in between. And when we're looking at examples like this, it's not just a matter of um, the clothing itself, but the styles and other accoutrements of indigenous heritage. These really represent what we would call in, uh, intellectual property. Uh, the designs, the, the knowledge, the, uh, the songs, you know, all of those intangible aspects of heritage, you know, beyond the tangible, beyond the material. In intellectual property has risen to uh, worldwide attention in recent decades. Uh, some years ago, I did a Google search of those terms, uh, intellectual property, and came up with something like 100 million hits. Uh, recently, and this is only five or six years later, you can see that there has been exponential growth. And this, of course, extends to uh, everything from music downloads to you know, secret formulas for Coca-Cola and all sorts of, of, of other uh, expressions. The World Intellectual Property uh, Organization defines uh, intellectual property in a very simple way, at least in this extracted statement, as creations of the mind. So this can take many, many different forms. We are most familiar with intellectual property in, in the context of patents and trademarks and copyrights and so on, in terms of what you can do as a purchaser of a book or a DVD. Uh, you could use it for your own enjoyment, but you cannot make copies and sell because it's someone else's intellectual property. There is a really important point to be made here. 
because archaeology and heritage has been so often focused on the material, on the tangible aspects of artifacts and archaeological sites and so on, uh, with great values given to things that are older or rarer. But what goes unsaid, what goes unrealized for most, is that none of these objects, none of these places, none of these things has any meaning without those intangible aspects that are part and parcel of them, at least in, in the context of the, of the makers, of the original users. Discerning what is an appropriation that is an unwelcome or unwanted a use of um, someone's cultural property, intellectual property, versus a borrowing of it, a more benign form of use. It's often difficult to distinguish between these two forms, between cultural uh, borrowings and appropriations. And let me give you a few examples to, to help you uh, understand what we're looking at here. This is the Parthenon, of course. This is perhaps the most famous building in, in the world. It's obviously, obviously part of Greek patrimony. Here's the British Museum. And there are countless other buildings, um, uh, and certainly those that date you know, well into the 17th uh, century and, and later, that, that exemplify classical Greek architecture and much more about classical Greek uh, culture. And this is what I would put as a kind of cultural borrowing. It's benign. It is not taking anything away from the Greeks. In fact, many would uh, see it as, as an expression of appreciation for, um, for what the Greeks had accomplished. But here's an example of something else, what we could call an appropriation. Uh, most of you are probably very familiar with the giant heads, the moe of Easter Island. You may not be familiar with the fact that you can buy a tissue box and pull tissues out of, of the nostrils. Now, you could look at this and say it's very clever and playful and so on, but what do the Easter Islanders, and yes, there are still Easter Islanders around, this is their heritage, what do they think of this kind of appropriation? Especially if these beings that are portrayed are um, supernatural um, uh, beings or gods or revered ancestors. I mean, this would fall under the category of an appropriation, a misuse. Let me show you some examples then. And you can mentally check off, you know, which, which do, you, do you think this is, you know, an appropriation or cultural borrowing? And you'll see that there's the question mark in the title. Is this an appropriation or not? In this case of ancient uh, Irish iconography, uh, the, these engraved stones around the base of the Neolithic site of Newgrange in Ireland. Uh, and you can find um, jewelry. Uh, that has you know, Celtic designs on it. And of course, there's ubiquitous you know, uh, Celtic uh, tattoos. What about this? Brian Youngin's recreation of Northwest Coast masks out of Nike basketball shoes. Or this. This is on the Camus Inn Reserve. And in the marquee of this, of this uh, petrol station, you will see... Uh, images of, of interior plateau rock art that is used as decoration or as a marker of Chiquemic identity or whatever that purpose is. So in these cases, you can see that it may not be easy to distinguish between appropriation and cultural borrowing, and certainly the context may be very important. If you saw these images on, um, a, um, on a storefront off the reserve in a location that was not owned by the Camos Indian Band, you might think that this is you know, inappropriate. In the same way, Brian Youngings, um, Northwest Coast Masks, he uh, is of uh, First Nations and Swiss ancestry. But I've never heard any complaint from any First Nations as to the inappropriateness of, of him using uh, first, uh, Northwest Coast Masks. And he is from the interior, by the way. Here's an example from uh, uh, the Yucatan, where you can uh, participate in an authentic Maya sweat bath. Or at the, at the site of Ushmal, there was this white woman banging away with a drum that had a bison head on it, perhaps a so-called New Age person. And she continued until the local Maya guards told her to go away because she was loco. So she may have been there to access, to engage with the, the energy or the history of that place. 
Uh, music videos, the band No Doubt. Um, you know, there's Gwen Stefani in her buckskins. And as far as I know, she is not of Native American ancestry. Uh, Inuit snow goggles. I was with an Inuit colleague, uh, and I showed him these images of sunglasses based on the classic snow goggles. And he was astounded that someone would do this and doubly astounded when he learned that these were selling for 40 uh, uh, British pounds. The Germans are mad about Native Americans, and uh, there are these Indian hobby clubs, and you'll have executives park their BMWs for the weekend, put on their buckskins, and live like Indians. Uh, many uh, First Nations or uh, Native American uh, dance groups and sing groups will go there and perform, uh, whereas others will think that these Germans are just nuts. And of course, there's the Inukshuk. Um, these have been a, uh, a part of the uh, 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 northern landscape for millennia, used as markers and have many other purposes. And of course, these became the, um, the logo of the 2010 Winter Olympics here in British Columbia. These, of course, have nothing to do with British Columbia. And here was a cartoon in the Vancouver Sun uh, pointing out the message left for these uh, two Inuit hunters that they have to take down their Inukshuk because the uh, Olympic Organizing Committee has, has um, trademarked them. And if you know anything about the Olympic Organizing Committee, they are notorious for um, uh, shunning anything with the name Olympic in it. Uh, there are uh, spiritual or sacred places like these so-called medicine wheels. And uh, some of these have been appropriated by so-called New Age groups who come and leave offerings. In some cases, they've taken them apart and put, in, put, put them back together as a way to partake in the energy or whatever these folks do. Uh, this kind of cultural borrowing versus uh, appropriation is not limited to indigenous peoples. And you could find examples uh, dealing with the Dead Sea Scrolls as you see in these products here, scarves and other uh, objects. We have examples of traditional foods from many parts of the world now being uh, commercialized. Ancient grains with a uh, faux uh, a Maya mask on it. And of course, there's Mel Gibson who's been appropriating everyone. Um, archaeologists, we have been guilty too. And here are two examples of publications that have um, uh, different aspects, different images of indigenous culture represented. The, the one on the left um, was the program for the Northwest Anthropology Conference held at SFU some years ago. And you see a, seat, a seated um, um, uh, figurine bowl there. And during this meeting, a First Nations man stood up and said how offended he was, how inappropriate this was, because to him and to many other indigenous peoples, this is a living being, even if it is to us a stone ball. So what you have here are a variety of examples, and of course I've been favoring those that are uh, likely appropriations. But the point is that not only is it difficult sometimes to discern between what is and, is and is not appropriate, but it goes beyond um, that to the need to recognize that, that the inappropriate use, the unwelcome use of some of these images can cause harm. And it's not just objects, it's not just um, rock art as you see with the coca pelli uh, taking many different forms. Um, you have t-shirts that have rock art images. Uh, you have sports teams with um, um, a variety of, of Native American related names. Sometimes people use this, use these images out of some sort of appreciation. Uh, in this case, these are the 2010 Russian ice skating team, and they were severely criticized by Aboriginal Australians for wearing uh, uh, costumes that, that had a kind of faux body paint and they were uh, doing their routine to a kind of faux didgeridoo music. And their response to the criticism was this. We reached, researched a lot of information on the internet. This was a very naive use of someone else's heritage. But when it comes down to it, here are some of the potential harms that occur. And these are real harms to real people. 
diminish respect for the sacred, uh, improper use of sacred symbols, loss of co confidentiality, uh, reproductions replace tribally produced work, and so on. Here you have Miss Canada 2008 wearing her buckskin bikini. She is of Iranian descent. In terms of um, examples of cultural, spiritual, and, or economic harm, let me just give you one or, or so of each. And the first is the Anukshik that I've already mentioned. You can purchase probably 200 plus different products that feature Anukshik in some form. Now, one can say, well, this is a celebration of Inuit culture. It's a celebration of Canadian culture. But the Inuit take a different view of this. And what was once a very special symbol to them has now lost much of that specialness. Because you could walk into a, a dozen gift shops here on Hastings Street and find all sorts of products that are reproductions. Another example, and this is a spiritual harm. These are examples of what we would call a rock art from Australia that are on T-shirts. And this is a very popular kind of, of um, clothing pro pro um, product. These are created by an Indonesian company. And uh, they were eventually made to cease and desist. Um, traditional owners, traditional Abor Aboriginal owners of these images came forward and made the argument that not only are these clan designs, in other words, these are the property of, the intellectual property of uh, particular groups, but these are used in a most inappropriate way because to uh, Aboriginal Australians, these images are not representations or images of um, ancestral beings and supernatural forces. Those entities are within those images. You know, so these are the images that are alive, and they could be very powerful, they could be very dangerous. Um, we find spiritual harms, too, with the Moriori and the Maori of New Zealand. Facial tattoos uh, had a very restricted use, and that you have Mike Tyson. Um, you have other kinds of toys that were being produced that incorporated Maori uh, terminology and uh, used the names of Maori sacred mountains and, and other spiritual beings. Economic harm, of course, there's the Cowichan sweaters, again, at the 2010 Winter Olympics. Um, Inuit clothing styles, you've had uh, New York designer Donna Karen try to market uh, a series of, of parkas until um, she came to her senses. That is, there was so much um, um, complaints that she decided to pull that, that clothing line. Is there always harm? No, there's not. And this is why we need to be careful about making assumptions about what is or is not harmful. And what's really important is to always ask, ask the traditional owners, is this appropriate or not? In the case of uh, the Egyptian room at Herod's, was that an appropriate use of Egyptian heritage? It certainly is when Daudi Farid, the owner of Herod's, built that room to celebrate his Egyptian heritage. But the problem is for indigenous peoples, they have historically had the least amount of control over their own heritage. They've received the least benefit from their heritage. The fewest resources and, and other limitations on what they can and cannot do. And much of the intellectual property issues that I've mentioned, these are not covered by copyright. They're not covered by trademark. They're not covered by patents. And those familiar means of Western legal protection. There's the uh, New Mexico state flag, and that was um, the result of a competition in the early 1900s for an image, and it was turned in by a physician who had bought a pot that had the so-called Zuni sun symbol on it. The Zuni uh, decided in the 1980s or 90s that they thought this in was inappropriate, and they took the state of New Mexico to court over the this uh, unwelcome use of, of the sun symbol. So as I mentioned at the beginning, there are different worldviews or different uh, cultural systems, different knowledge systems that are at play here. And what's important to know about indigenous peoples, and here I'm going to you know, grossly generalize, is that their conception of the world may be very different from those in the Western world, where in the West we tend to put a Cartesian grid on the world and divide everything up into neat categories. 
And yet, those categories do not exist in terms of the familiar dichotomies of nature versus culture and a past versus present and people versus environment. For many indigenous peoples, those divisions are not there, which means that ancestral beings may be part of this dim dimension, not some other supernatural dimension. So there are a lot of challenges here then in terms of what do we uh, consider to be appropriate or not? Where is the, the, the line between fair use and, and exploitation? It's not easy. But this is something that all of us need to contend with, whether we're researchers, whether the public, whether we are policymakers. And in addition to these uh, aspects of um, uh, commercialization, appropriation, and so on that I've given you some examples of, there are all sorts of new challenges coming down that we need to be aware of. Um, the fact that we are now in a DNA revolution that is allowing us unprecedented detail into movements of people around the world going back hundreds of thousands of years. And yet this has implications for modern peoples, not all of which have been yet realized. There is um, a variety of, of um, uh, challenges relating to uh, commercialization. Uh, here you have uh, a Thunderbird image from the interior plateau, and here you have two wine companies, uh, one that is native-owned, um, the cup from a Soyuz, that is using traditional interior plateau rock art, and on the bottom, Yellowtail from Australia, using a so-called X-ray style Aboriginal art. Um, that style is not marketed within Australia. It's considered safe to market outside the country. Uh, new challenges coming out of archaeotourism and cultural tourism. New challenges about online museums and what you can access remotely re relating to uh, museums and other kinds of, of cultural repositories. Uh, lots of, of questions and lots of opportunities about creative commons and open access. And a new area that, that's just coming into being is 3D scanning and printing where with the right equipment you can scan an object and create countless copies at any scale. And the question is, you know, do you have rights to uh, copy, to reproduce, to market, whatever that object is? So one can be very depressed by all of these challenges, and yet they're great opportunities. So how do you make your way through this very tangled, very complicated you know, realm of intellectual property and different cultural heritage systems and so on? Well, this is the second part uh, that I want to launch into, and that is how do you go from wanting to do the right thing, which most people, I think, really want to do, uh, to figure out, well, what is that right thing to do? So in other words, how do we transform good intentions into actions? And this brings me to um, giving a little bit of information about the iPinch project that Eldon uh, mentioned at the very beginning. This, is, uh, this has been an eight-year project that has sought to engage with indigenous peoples and scholars and policymakers to address a series of really important, really needed um, objectives relating to uh, intellectual and other aspects of cultural heritage to identify the kinds of problems that are out there, to analyze how and why these images, these controversies emerge and when and where uh, they do, to generate new and deep knowledge about those circumstances and those uh, contexts, and then finally to make our findings available to the people who can really benefit from this knowledge. This is an international project uh, our team is comprised of over 50 scholars. In fact, Eldon is, is one of the team members uh, of archaeologists, anthropologists, ethicists, uh, museum specialists, uh, lawyers and legal scholars, and many others, with um, about 25 to 30 uh, partners, indigenous and other partners around the world, and uh, a very large research team of associates and students and, and, and others. One of the uh, most satisfying, one of the most important aspects of this project has been a series of community-oriented projects uh, in which the community has complete control over the project that IPINCH is providing funding or partial funding for. 
as my colleague Sheila Greer puts it, what does research look like when uh, the community is in the driver's seat? And this is one of my favorite photographs of Geronimo in his Cadillac. Our case studies, our community-based uh, projects are found uh, mostly in North America, but also in, in other parts of the world. And I want to just give you a sampling of what some of these look like. And the first is one uh, in the far north with the Inuvi Aleut. And this project is all about a collection of artifacts, a collection of objects that were collected about 150 years ago by a Hudson Bay trader and ended up in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. This is a project about repatriation, but the Inuvi Aleut don't want the objects back. They want the information that is contained within them. So some years ago, uh, a group of Inu Inuvi Aleut elders and youth and filmmakers went to the Smithsonian and they spent uh, some time examining these objects, parkas and boots and, and so on, to record them and to bring that information back to the community, to put that information back to youth. A second project is with the Saginaw Chippewa tribe of Michigan. And this focuses on a large um, collection of, of engraved rock images um, on a uh, piece of exposed bedrock on the ground. And here you have uh, an image of an archer that is one such image. Uh, this is now part of a park. Uh, the uh, petroglyph panel is covered by uh, a shelter with a large fence around it. And this is a set of images that is still being used today by the Saginaw Chippewa. And here you have a cleansing ceremony. Uh, the rock needs to be scrubbed because you have birds and bat, bats roosting under uh, the eaves and, and soiling the images. But this is an example of heritage being a living thing. It's, it's still part of the community. Um, the ironic thing is that uh, the Saginaw Chippewa do not have a key to the gate and I was visiting the site some years ago, and we had to wait for a park employee to come to let tribal members in to have access to their own heritage. So this project is all about developing new relations with the state of Michigan and with uh, the archaeological society there. We're working with the Moriori um, in coastal New Zealand, and this is a project that is designed to collect um, cultural information about land use and, and so on from elders. Uh, and part of this project has the youth engaged with them, uh, both in terms of recording and filming. Part of this project is also uh, recovering information from uh, what are called sacred groves uh, of, of trees that are living ancestors, as you see here. The Moriori are challenged by the fact that some of these trees are diseased, and they've made the decision to record the image, uh, images on these by 3D scanning, as you see here. So here's a way that the Moriori are uh, working to meet their own needs using um, Western technology. Uh, we're working also in Nunavik on, on a project that is um, where the community wants to um, participate in cultural tourism, but they're wary of the negative impacts that this may have. Working in Kyrgyzstan to support a series of community-based uh, cultural heritage initiatives in a post-Soviet environment. Working with the Stolo. This project is focusing on ancestral human remains and how researchers should move towards studying them with the proper protocols before they are returned. So here is a way that the STOLO are helping to develop new policies, new, new protocols to engage with and extend scientific knowledge that should and, and will benefit the STOLO, but only on their terms. And I think that is absolutely acceptable, if not desirable. Uh, working with folks uh, in Chukwetmik territory and working in uh, Japan, working in, in uh, Southern Africa with Asan. So a lot of community uh, initiatives, all of which are identified, um, uh, all of which the communities have identified their needs, what's the appropriate approach, and have complete control over the process. 
we've been also funding a number of other types of initiatives. Uh, one that is uh, developed by Kim Christian and Jane Anderson on developing licensing for um, cultural heritage so that items can be shared, but the user knows what the limitations on the use of that object will be, much like Creative Commons. We have funded a, uh, a wonderful film on uh, the Haida Weaver, Dolores Churchill. She replicated um, Quade Dan Sinchi's hat. This was uh, uh, a man who died uh, many hundreds of years ago, found in a glacier. And DNA studies were done of this individual, and Dolores has uh, a genetic affinity to him, so she is uh, related in some fashion to him. Uh, so this great film is one that we, we, we partially funded. And we have been a source for um, information gathering and, and sharing for some time, and we'll, we will continue to do that. Uh, recently meeting with the Chinese State Ethnic Af uh, Affairs Commission, um, and a few months ago I spoke to the Canadian Babyware Summit. Uh, these are uh, individuals who are making all sorts of baby products, and they wanted to be proactive and to ensure that they were aware of, of uh, what were the means by which they could avoid appropriating, uh, avoid using uh, indigenous designs um, in ways they shouldn't be. Of course, as an academic product, uh, uh, as an academic project, we have produced the usual kinds of academic stuff, you know, a lot of books and journals and so on. But I think more exciting and more useful to the majority of people are such things as these. We now have about 70 videos on our iPinch uh, YouTube um, channel. We have podcasts, we have viewing guides, we have all sorts of other resources. And the website itself uh, will continue after this project formally ends. So we are continu con continuing to feed uh, a lot of new materials into it. So with the iPinch project, this is an academic project, but it's one in which we are foregrounding um, indigenous heritage needs. We're working closely with communities, and we are ensuring that the communities are the primary beneficiaries of academic or other research on their heritage. And in the course of this project, there are you know, many lessons that I've learned, um, some of which have been hard-earned lessons where um, working in other cultures, you make mistakes. But one of the things about making mistakes is it can often open up an entirely new and very deep understanding of different cultural systems. So here are some of the things that I've learned. And the first is that we have to recognize that there are different conceptions of heritage, of property, and some of these other concepts that we cannot assume are the same in Western and indigenous societies. So here you have a young Maori girl who is with a living ancestor. Archaeologists would call this a, a dendroglyph, a carving on a tree. And there's, of course, a lot of scientific you know, information in this. But for the Moriori, they don't look at it, at it that way. This is, you know, someone, someone, something that is living. Repatriation is not just about returning things, as with the Nuvialia case. It's also about returning information. And some of the information that was collected by the Nuvialia with their Smithsonian trip, those uh, styles of moccasins, of boots, are now reintroduced into the community and are now being made again. A third lesson is that we need to be uh, looking for indigenous heritage models. You know, one or, or those in which um, decisions about heritage management are informed by local needs, local values, local decision-making processes. We absolutely have to move from the, the current standard in British Columbia and elsewhere, the current standard of consultation, which is all too shallow, to consent, whereby the, uh, the First Nations in a heritage um, management context uh, have to give con con uh, consent, not just be consulted. They have to give consent before uh, their heritage is impacted. And of course, there are many, many challenges with uh, the type of community-based uh, research that I've been pointing, pointed out. 
Um, and this includes cultural differences and language differences. Um, it's often very pronounced in places like Japan, working with the indigenous Ainu, where th there are very few English speakers. So you're working to try to convey very sophisticated uh, concepts of heritage through translators, and you're always wondering what is getting lost in translation, or dealing with cultural context, where, as with the Japanese, they'll frequently nod and say yes, which doesn't mean they agree with you. It means we're listening to you. In the same way, in, in First Nations uh, context in, in British Columbia and elsewhere, silence does not mean consent. So there are all sorts of lessons, and being an anthropologist really helps you know, wade through some of these cultural differences. So iPinch has been working with uh, communities all over, and we're also trying to move things forward to uh, address some of the, the bottlenecks in the current research uh, system. For example, working with universities. Universities are not really well set up to work with communities. They like working with other universities. So in aid of um, sharing lessons that we've learned, uh, last spring we held uh, uh, the Working Better Together Ethics Conference that brought together university research ethics officers and other administrators and funding agencies um, to work out, to share ideas about how we can expedite this kind of community-oriented research. There are other kinds of, of, of issues that we have engaged with. As I mentioned, there are great opportunities for DNA research and there are uh, increasing numbers of examples where living peoples have been identified as the descendants of uh, those folks found in archaeological context, sometimes five or 6,000 years uh, old. So last fall, we held the DNA and Indigeneity uh, Symposium and Workshop that brought together leading uh, indigenous and other scholars in this area. We have a series of videos on this that are already on the iPinch website. And we're also working to help um, those folks making commercial products and the public um, sort out what is and is not appropriate. And here's an example. And it seems like every two or three months, there's something that hits the headlines. And this was one that was given a lot of prominent attention. KTZs, the clothing designers, uh, $1,000 plus uh, clothing that are based on a known shaman's uh, parka. And on the left, you see that individual. The KTC, KTC company made, you know, the usual claim of, you know, this is a respectful use until, you know, public opinion um, overwhelmed them and they pulled the product. But in response to such things, um, early this year, we put out the Think Before You Appropriate uh, guidebook. And this is for um, uh, creators of clothing and other products and designers to help them understand, for example, um, what are the costs, what are the risks of misappropriation, and, and here is um, for the indigenous artists that are involved, um, you know, some of the potential uh, risks of, of, you know, reinforcement of stereotypes and so on. And the same thing by providing the benefits and in this case, uh, for companies, non-indigenous or other companies, you know, it, 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 there's less risk for your products if you go about this in a careful and respectful way. This, by the way, is available for free on our, uh, on our website. But to get back to the larger issue of heritage, particularly in British Columbia, but not exclusively, there are some really significant challenges that we are now facing. And again, you just have to look at the newspapers from time to time to see yet another issue blow up. So I've, I've labeled this section two steps forward and one step back because while we are making progress, at the same time, we're constantly amazed that people still don't get some basic, uh, don't have a basic understanding of what's at stake here. And the case in point is, as you may be familiar with, Grace Islet. And this was a controversy that raged you know, for quite some time uh, this was a very small islet in which there is a known heritage site with burial, 16 burial cairns, and somehow the individual who purchased this had permission to build, and this was going to be a very uh, upscale house. And I've lost an image. Um, but in any case, 
um, the individual was building around and on top of the barrel count, uh, cairns without actually touching them. But this was clearly inappropriate. This was uh, an affront to local First Nations. And what we had done as uh, IPINCH team members was we came together and we drafted a declaration, a declaration on the safeguarding of indigenous ancestral burial grounds as sacred sites and cultural landscapes. Um, I'm not going to you know, read this to you, but I want to, to just highlight the last section of this. You know, it starts by saying you know, that, that burial sites are important to all peoples and goes through a series of very logical, very uh, sensible statements. And then we end with this. Federal government, provincial governments of Canada, local governments, local authorities, First Nations leaders, public and private stakeholders, and civil society to act immediately for protecting First Nations ancestral burial grounds of British Columbia from destruction, damage, and alteration to develop effective mechanisms that go beyond consultation, and so on. And what we are doing is not pointing out anything new or anything radical, but we are pointing to existing obligations that all of those entities have. We're reminding them of what they are morally and already legally obliged to do. And when we put this declaration out in December of 2014, on, um, we also solicited personal and organizational endorsements. And we received endorsements from some of the leading um, anthropological and archaeological associations in the world, as well as uh, such organizations as the David Suzuki Foundation and all of the First Nations leadership organizations in British Columbia. We also had many uh, uh, private or individual endorsements, and we have one, as you can see here, from David Suzuki. So this really um, touched on a wide array of, of um, perspectives on such places as the sacred places burial sites that were not being treated respectfully. Soon after the declaration came out, the province of British Columbia announced a resolution that Grace Islet was going to be purchased by a um, environmental conservancy and the local First Nations were satisfied with this. The land, the island, the one hectare island was purchased for $5.45 million, .4 million of which only 840000 was for the property and the rest was for losses suffered. And yet, has anyone ever asked, you know, what were the losses that the First Nations suffered for the years of, of desecration and the years of fighting for recognition of sacred places for them. But there are still many unresolved issues, and they include these, that Canada has not yet fulfilled its obligation to indigenous peoples and has not yet signed on to the UN Declaration of the Rights for Indigenous Peoples although there are murmurs from Ottawa that uh, Trudeau may be leaning in that direction. We can only hope so. The second, as I mentioned earlier, is that access to protection of one's own heritage has to be acknowledged as a basic human right because we're dealing with people's lives, with their well-being, with their identity. We can also make the argument that the intentional destruction the intentional disturbance of ancestral burial grounds and heritage sites and other kinds of significant places actually represents a kind of violence. We need to acknowledge that all of the dead must re be respected. And in British Columbia, if an archaeological site, if a burial, if human remains date to before 1846, they are treated as archaeological remains. If they date to after that, they are dealt with, they're, they're considered a cemetery. So you have a race-based distinction between how the dead are accorded dignity and protection in British Columbia. Another important point, Grace Islet has not been resolved. 
or at least the underlying issues that emerge to Grace Islet, those have not been emerged. Grace Islet has. And what I mean by this is that there are still cases that are continuing to come out, such as Lightning Rock and Sumas. Uh, here you have a headline. Uh, you have a developer who spent $40 million on a property is now not able to develop it. And unfortunately, First Nations often come across as the villains, and yet those sites are supposed to be protected by the Heritage Conservation Act. You know, that is a legal entity that offers protection. So First Nations are often seen as you know, the troublemaker or the villain for trying to have their heritage protected as it is supposed to under law. And finally, with the resolution of Grace Islet, Forestry Minister uh, Steve Thompson promised a review of the Heritage Act to help make it more efficient and work better. That was over a year ago, and there has yet to be any public announcement of that. So if you feel so moved, do drop the Minister Thompson a note to ask wh what's going on here. So let me just wrap up uh, some key points here. And these are what I've come to learn about indigenous heritage over the course of, of my career. And the first, as I've already mentioned, is heritage is not just about things. It's about people's lives. It's about all of those values and memories and songs and stories and those intangible, intangible aspects that make us make others who they are. Heritage is not just limited to the past. Here's a living ancestor. Heritage permeates the fabric of indigenous societies. In fact, in some indigenous societies, there is no word for heritage because it's part of who you are. Heritage is mostly intangible. Stories, values, beliefs. Heritage research can have unintended consequences. Here is a DNA strand, and if you, you know, took a look at your own DNA, teased it apart enough, you'd see all of those terms associated with those little elements. Uh, genetic markers, evidence of migration, ownership, uh, collaborative research, informed consent, biocolonialism, cultural identity, all of these things and many more are wrapped up in DNA research. And we need to be aware that not only that DNA can not only reveal wonderful things, but can reveal um, information that can be very damaging to people. And heritage needs to be uh, heritage needs to be managed by the heritage holders. I mean, that is simply common sense. And as I mentioned uh, in an earlier talk on, on some of these things, you know, this isn't rocket science. This is um, very sensible um, kinds of observations that go to the heart of indigenous heritage values. But what is so important is that the public and policymakers and, and practitioners and teachers and landowners and everyone else needs to be aware that we're dealing with different cultural systems and we need to be respectful of those differences. So finally, I think I could you know, bring together everything that I've mentioned into this statement in terms of when we are working with someone else's heritage, when we are working with indigenous peoples, that we need to go ahead with our work as if someone else, someone's life is on the line, because that's what we're dealing with when we're dealing with indigenous cultural heritage. It's not just about objects, it's about the whole system. Thank you. <laughs>